Welcome to Behind the Bronze, the sculptor Morris Blake. I'm Rachel Stern, director and CEO of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art, based in New York. We research, discuss, publish, and exhibit artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. With this work, we commemorate their lives and achievements. All our virtual programs are free of charge. Please help us keep it that way and donate to us. You can find the link in the chat function. Thank you. Today's program features Morris Blick, who will tell us a little bit of his early childhood, will read from his recently published autobiographical book, The Art of Survival, followed by a conversation with a British British art historian, curator, author, and innovative educator, Julian Freeman. Morris Blick was born to Jewish parents in Amsterdam in 1939. In 1943, Blick's father was sent to Auschwitz, while Blick, his sister, his pregnant mother, and grandmother were sent to the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. Liberated by the Russian army in 1945, he moved with his mother and older sister to England. Blick had an extensive career in art education, teaching, and all levels from primary to postgraduate. He studied sculpture at Hornsey College of Art in London and has a postgraduate art teacher certificate with distinction from the University of London. In the 1980s, he began to develop, to develop his own artwork and in 1991 gave up teaching to work full time as a sculptor. Dr. Julian Freeman is an art historian, curator, author, and innovative educator who has worked almost exclusively in and with galleries, universities, and colleges in London and the south of England. He is presently a gallery educator for the Coteau Gallery London. Julian's research preferences lie within modern British art and its context, and he has drawn on this for contributions to a range of day schools and conferences, from Brighton to New York to Reykjavik. He has reviewed for art journals past and present, including the Burlington Magazine, Apollo, the Art Book, and the British Art Journal. There have also been two books, um, each intended to demystify its subject. The Very Irvent Art, a Crash Course, uh, published by Simon & Schuster in 1998, and British Art, A Walk Through the Rusty Pier, published by South Bank in 2006. An important re-evaluation of the later work of the English painter, printmaker, and war artist Anthony Gross was published in October 2021 by the Goldmark Gallery in Rutland. Welcome, Morris Blake and David Freeman. Thank you. It's your Thank turn you. now, <laughs> Morris. So can I start, first of all, going very briefly through a few um, things about my background, and then we get on to the subject proper, as it were. Um, and uh, I will do a short, very short part. Mm. Morris, you've gone dark. You've gone, your voice is gone. Are we all right now? Uh, now we are. Yeah. Um, so that, I don't know if you hear that. That's me and my sister, Clara, uh, 1946, obviously just after the war when we came to England. I was born next. Slide, please. The next one. The next one. Yes, Amsterdam. Some of you may have been there. A lovely, picturesque 17th century uh, city, um, which is where I was born. And the next slide, um, which is myself 
on the right there, when I was, I don't know, two, three years old, my mother obviously reading to myself and my sister Clara, who's a couple of years older than me. And then there's a shot, a sort of general shot of uh, Amsterdam again. And on the left on my screen, anyhow, my mother, the smart dresser, and my sister Clara there, also smartly dressed. <laughs> the next slide um, shows my family. I can't tell you who everybody is there because I don't know, but that you can get a sense of the sort of fairly extensive family that I was born into. I do know on the very right front is my grandmother, um, Amelia, who we know as Omar, which was Dutch for grandmother. And somewhere there peering out is my father. He's about the third or fourth um, on, the, on the right next to my grandmother. The other people I can't identify you, but obviously aunts, uncles, and so on. And the next slide is a slightly more, um, uh, you know, bigger. My father there on the left, enjoying a cigar, my grandmother, Omar, in the middle, and both my mother and father there on the right. Um, so the next slide shows you where we lived. We lived on the first floor uh, in America. I think we call that the second floor. But anyhow, we above the shop. The shop was a, was a grocery shop. Um, nothing to do with us, but we lived above that. And we had the little door there. There's two doors, ours was the door on the right. And as you entered that door, um, next slide shows um, a steep staircase, very common in Dutch houses, very narrow, steep staircases, which many years later when I well, 50 odd years later, when I revisited it, appeared through the letterbox and was absolutely shocked to realize that it was still there. I don't know why it shocked me, but anyhow, after 50 years and all that, um, it really hit me. Um, so I took a photograph of it just for the record. After a while, um, next slide, please. We were. Uh, pretty much confined to our apartment. And we were all had the pleasure of having these stars sewn on our, on our clothes. I'm not sure you know about it, which that's a Dutch word for Jew. And when I asked my mother, uh, why, you know, I'm three years old. And she said, oh, well, we're special people. We need to be recognized. Um, I'll leave you with that. And uh, the, the next slide shows where we were taken to Westerbork concentration camp in 1943. Uh, that was an interim camp uh, where people were shipped off from there to various other camps. It wasn't a terrible place. We got, we were, the next slide will show um, my Mother, uh, we were there with, um, as I think uh, Rachel said, myself, my mother, obviously, my older sister, uh, my father and my grandmother. And my mother and my grandmother, both being English, were able to write to my aunt, effectively, my mother's sister, uh, these very heavily censored letters, uh, which nonetheless were they, they, they were able to communicate with my aunt Esther, who lived in Cheltenham in England. Um, and she, my aunt Esther, kept all these letters till well after the war and gave them to me about 20 years ago. Um, so there were just two of the um, letters that came backwards and forwards. Um, I won't go into all the details of that now. That's a whole long history. And finally, as it were, next slide. Um, we were shipped off to the Baron Belsen uh, at the end of 1943, pretty much. My father had already been dispatched from Westerbork 
uh, we had no idea the, the story is he was taken off to Auschwitz, but um, as far as we know, he, he was shipped off and that was the last we saw of him. So that kind of sketches in the background. And perhaps if we can now go to um, Julian to uh, the next slide. And I will then read a short passage from the book, well, a couple of passages really. Maybe wear these because it's a great light. Um, what the slide shows is the bowl that in Belson we were given to uh, get our food in, such as it was. So if you bear with me for a few minutes, halfway between Hamburg and Hanover in the north of Germany, Baron Belson was intensely cold when we arrived during the winter of 43. Popeye's job, so called because the pipe he constantly sucked on, was to do the appell, the roll call. We'd be summoned to stand outside in our meager clothing as he marched past, counting us. The colder the weather, the more times he managed to get it wrong, we'd have to start all over again. With a balaclava over my still bandaged head, I would stand with the hundreds of others shivering in the freezing cold, and suffering this eternal charade. The camp consisted of wooden huts, wooden three-tier bunks. Ours was euphemistically known as Star Camp. My mother, an intelligent woman, managed to secure a top bunk for the three of us. That's myself, obviously, my sister, Clara, and her, which gave us few advantages. We had better air circulation and avoided being covered in bodily fluids from people in bunks above. We slept head to toe, Clara and me at one end and my mother, her feet in our faces at the other. I don't recall where Omar slept, that's my grandmother, or even whether she was in the same hut as us. The bases of the bunks were wooden slats, some of which were used to fuel the one stove in the barrack, but it wasn't long before available fuel for the stove was exhausted since it was vital to not leave enough slats to sleep on. Our bunk was our home, it, where we ate, slept, and congregated in the mornings. Clara and I would distract ourselves by getting rid of as many body lice as possible. The technique was simple. You put the lance on your thumbnail and you snap it in two with the other one a little jet of blood would spurt out, and we made a game of seeing how far we could make it go. Washing took place at a long communal trough fitted with several cold water taps along its length. There was one lavatory, but it quickly ceased to be usable. Wooden planks with holes cut out became the rudimentary and the communal alternative. The trick in Belson was to get enough food to stay alive. Served from a large cauldron, it consisted of a watery liquid with potato, turnip, and other vegetables floating in it. You would queue up with your metal dish and receive a portion. The further back in line you were, the more chance you had of getting some of the good stuff because the vegetables would float to the bottom. But when you're starving, it's hard to be restrained. People wanted to get their ration as soon as possible, afraid it might run out. Sometimes I was able to rejoin the queue and get a second helping, which I would take back to my mother, who was now nursing my baby sister, Millie. Millie had appeared one night. I don't recall her arrival. I imagine my mother took herself off to a quiet corner to give birth. There must have been one or two midwives amongst the prisoners in the camp, and I like to think she had the assistance of one of them. But I don't know. It's nothing, it's not something I could ever ask my mother about. The other way to obtain food was to grab it from dead people. And some days we would be given a portion of bread, which we would eke out for as long as possible. 
The safest way to do this was to sleep with it under your head. So they had a chance of waking up if somebody tried to steal it. When somebody died, the first thing to do was to check if they had any bread under their head. Everyone had cottoned on to this, so you had to be quick. Clara and I became good at spotting when people were about to die. 1945, we moved on a couple of years. Irma Grazer. Six, can we have the slide of her? One more back. That's it. Here she is, yeah. This is Irma Grazer. Six, well, you see there, six of you are going out, but only five of you are coming back. The dogs are hungry today. Irma Grazer was a beautiful young camp guard who had a habit of taking prisoners out to work and coming back with fewer. In she stormed, black polished jack boots, holstered pistols strapped around her waist and her Alsatian dog leashed at her side. She saw me sitting on the floor next to someone's bunk waiting for them to die so that I could grab the food under their head and take it back for my family. She stared straight at me, thought for a moment and then grinned. Slowly and deliberately, she reached into one of the deep pockets of her military jacket and took out a shiny red apple. She held it in her hand for a moment, admiring it, and then began crunching into it, her eyes fixed on me. Juices began trailing down the sides of her mouth. I knew she was taunting me. I kept still, not daring to move or show any reaction. She ate the apple down to the core and then placed it carefully on the floor, unleashing the dog and setting it to guard the remains before she walked off. Dog and I faced each other as it sat on its back legs with the core between its front legs, snarling and baring its teeth. I remained stock still trying to show no fear. I knew if I ran or tried to grab the apple core, it would tear me apart. We sat like that for I don't know how long until she came back. Amused to see that I hadn't tried to make a grab for the apple core, she stomped on it and ground the remains into the bare wooden floorboards until there was nothing left even to scrape up. Then putting the dog back on its leash, she paced out of the hut, looking pleased with her lesson. This was probably a minor episode in her daily repertoire of sadism, but I like to think that I thwarted her expectations with me. She didn't come back to a five-year-old bloodied and mauled by the dog's jaws. She found me expressionless and calm, exactly as she'd left me. In my own way, I stood up to her. I felt the victory was mine. Over to you. <clears throat> I think so. Good afternoon, everybody. Morris, we discussed what we might say when we might um, go into in some depth during the course of this session. And the first question is really the first of two, a main question and a supplementary. Your autobiography indicates something of the way in which you arrived at your decision subsequent to your encounter with Irma Gracer to follow art rather, rather than medicine. The latter, of course, was what all Jewish parents would like for their children. Was there something particular that affected your decision to do the one, one and not the other? And secondly, that choice of direction was important. Was there a particular turning point that persuaded you to follow sculpture rather than painting or another medium? Yes, indeed. There were really two issues there. Um, I haven't said, and obviously the book covers this, but when I was in the camp, I had a problem and I had some serious surgery on my ears, on both ears. I had mastoid 
surgery, which meant removing part of the skull at the back of the ear. So it's quite serious. And, and it was done under the most um, primitive conditions. And I'm frankly lucky to be alive at all. Um, I was very fortunate that there was a, obviously a very skilled surgeon, one of the prisoners who performed the surgery. And um, which is why when I referred to going to Belson, I still had a balaclava over my head was still bandaged up and so on. Anyhow, um, subsequently, when we were finally out of there and came to England, my mother um, thought it best to have this stuff checked over because I had some problems with the surgery and the ears and so on. So I'd gone into a hospital and, you know, proper hospital this time. And when I emerged from the anesthetic, I said to my mother, you know, this is, this is for me, I'm going to do medicine, I'm going to be a doctor and uh, cure people, as you say, you know, unbelievable um, to her ears. And whatever she said, I couldn't hear because I'd all bandaged up. But anyhow, this was my ambition for the next 10 years from the age of about six to 16. And as you know, Julian, in England, when you decide to go to uh, some career or other and, and you have to make your university choices, obviously I was going to choose the appropriate ones to do medicine. But literally the night before I had to make the choice, I revisited in my hypnagogic state, I revisited Belson and all the awful um, stuff that I had to deal with there. You know, people dying, corpses, people on the verge of death. Uh, and I felt I couldn't confront that again in my, in my mind. I thought, well, medicine dealing with sick, dying people, I couldn't hack it. And um, I decided I wanted to make my own world. The world I witnessed was too horrible to revisit. And I was going to make my own world. And I'd been at school, obviously, and um, good at art, and uh, decided that I would use art to make, recreate, if you like, in my fantasy, in my own world. And so that's why I decided that day I came down to tell my mother, um, I'm going to art school, uh, not medicine. And I went off to art school and I enjoyed it very much. And uh, you, you, you asked really what it meant for me doing art and it has had a huge, healing effect for one of a better word I was able to indulge in my own world make my own world and um, so yeah it was a great healing it has been still is I'm still doing it um, and it does have this wonderful positive um, meaning to me so and then yeah. the sculpture <laughs> So if we look at the next slide, um, this would be something which followed on eventually. Um, here is a, a typical, unfortunately, a, a, almost a stock shot of the sites that confronted the British army when they liberated Belson. Yeah. And the next one, it confronted me also, Julian. That's really what I referred to just now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Are we okay here? We are. Do you want to go back? Well, this this slide is is it has a particular relevance in some respects to what you've been discussing beforehand. The dog uh, that accompanied Irma Grazer in her daily ministrations to her prisoners. Um, was the subject of this particular sculpture, which we see here at a very much later point in a uh, quiet London backwater, quite near to one of your, in fact, quite near to your gallery, I think, Maurice. It is. Um, yeah. The, um, 
the image is a very important one in your catalogue uh, for reasons which you've gone some way to indicate. But I wonder whether or not you think that its meaning has altered in some respects uh, from something directly related to that personal experience. And as part of this healing process that you've actually managed to use the figure of the dog, uh, a hollow dog, a toothless dog in this particular mm. image to mean something which has taken your experience from Belson into a, a later present. Yes, I, I was asked by somebody once when I told them about this confrontation, why didn't I make friends with the dog? <laughs> In a way, I think that's what's happened. Uh, this, this, this animal, I mean, it stands chest high to me. So it's, it, it's kind of imagined if I was a, still a, a five-year-old, you know, where it would come, so it's huge. Um, and I, I, it now resides at, at our house where I live with Deborah, and it kind of guards the premises in a, in a much more amenable way. Um, it, it, I made it because I was offered an exhibition, my first solo show, at the age of 45, um, which was a bit daunting. Um, but nevertheless, I, I was offered this at a, at a very upmarket London gallery. And I thought it's quite, a, a, it's quite an ask, at, at, you know. So I thought I need to confront this, this fear, if you like. And I thought by making this dog, it would somehow symbolize that uh, episode, but, but it would more importantly symbolize facing your fears. And if I could face it and, you know, live to tell the tale, as it were, um, that would do the job. Um, it's called Hollow Dog for two reasons. First of all, uh, people may not know, but all these huge bronze sculptures you see all over the place, they're actually hollow. And they are, even the very big ones are no more. I have to go imperial now, don't I not metric? The, the, probably the, the thickest are no more than an inch thick. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that, which, for, you know, I'm not going to go into now. But all big, anything more than a sculpture the size of an apple would be hollow. Um, so I think it was appropriate to call it hollow dog because it is literally hollow. But probably more importantly, I sensed even as a five-year-old that this dog was really under control of its master, the dreaded Irma Geyser, that he had no will of its own. And um, therefore it was hollow in that sense. So I thought it was an appropriate title for it. And uh, there it stood, as, as, as you said quite rightly, Julian, that. The, wasn't the entrance to the gallery. The gallery is in, in a main road and then the rear to it is in a, in a kind of smaller road, which is exactly where it stood. In fact, you're looking at the gap from the gallery at the dog in this shot. What I, what I might add, I think just to sort of come back a little bit about choosing sculpture, I think that was an important point that I should have said that, um, when I went to art school and, and I, you know, I was good at painting, I know that. And even at school, my art teacher said, you know, on my report, my sense of color was a gift. And I was good at that stuff. And I thought, well, I've done that. I need a bigger challenge. And when I found the sculpture studio in the art school and the smell of the clay and the, just the kind of atmosphere I immediately fell in love with clay and it's such a primitive basic and you know it's it's the earth I mean when what more primeval can you get so I dug into the clay literally and um, I have been working with clay ever since and I think there's another side which occurred to me just just a little while ago that somewhere in the book 
there's an episode where I mentioned my little sister, my, you know, was born in Belson and she died there and she never made it to her first birthday. And I was the big brother who had made a present for her. I found a little carrot somewhere and I stuck some little sticks in it to make masks. So I now had a boat, which I was going to give Millie on her first birthday, but she never got there. And I think deep down in my psyche, even, uh, I mean, I wasn't conscious of it. And I, you know, maybe completely off, off beam with it, but somewhere in my deep down in my unconscious brain, I think I like to make things to please people. And every time I make a sculpture, I, I'm in fear and trepidation that it will be rejected like my little sister rejected my I mean you know, this is balmy logic obviously but nevertheless I think there is there is a motivation somewhere lurking about so sculpture I could make and as it was pointed out to me this this carrot boat that I made for Millie uh, it was pointed out to me it was probably my first sculpture so I just wanted to remake and remake and remake and get approval for it so there you have it thank you very much indeed and if we look at the next this is perhaps a continuation of this process yeah. um uh, people may wonder why you and i are on this uh session together uh, and the one of the reasons for this was because back in the uh late 90s uh, by chance i watched a bbc documentary on sculpture in which this particular work featured it was a it was a documentary on a uh, commemorative sculpture particularly and it was a very very telling experience I didn't know Morris's work but it was particularly affecting because of its topic uh, and I think that there's something you've actually touched this uh, I think that there's something in the business of making commemorative sculpture where you're giving something back you're, you're asking for approval in a way, in an indirect way, but uh, in doing so, you're reminding a wider audience of an event which perhaps they have all experienced in different ways, and yet you want to affect their understanding of that event. And this particular topic, uh, which of course you unfortunately have very direct and uh, deep-seated um, memories about, is something which you've returned to. And there, there are in fact two uh, maquettes that you've made on the theme of Belson, yes. which have never made it effectively to a full-scale realization. One, the one on the left, which we can see in front of us, would be, as viewers can also see, a massive structure. But the one on the right, the maquette for this particular survivor's memorial, suggests to me that something much more personal, and you may have something to say about this, I suspect. Um, but for me, uh, the way in which you've talked about the dog uh, and the way in which you've talked about the, the boat uh, convey something which I've written about elsewhere, about your work. It, there are certain features uh, in the way in which you put this. You've stated this very clearly, very simply, uh, but you've somehow also managed to talk about the boat with the same sort of conceptual elevation, this sounds a bit flowery perhaps, but it's all there in this particular maquette on the right it, for the survivor's memorial. And that I'm sure would have been very, very personal to you. How do you see this kind of activity? What do you want to achieve when you make a sculpture of this kind for a wider audience? Yeah, well, as you say, Julian, the two very distinct memorials. One is what I call the Holocaust Memorial, which is the one on, on the left on the screen, which is a massive structure. And what I wanted to convey there was the enormity of the number of people that were murdered, the six million or so people. And how does one convey that number? I mean, it's, it's I can't imagine that number and so the one on the left is a huge structure which is a granite uh, circular tomb for a better word which is engraved with 
these tiny squares where you see a detail of it, um, uh, one uh, centimeter squares, uh, so that you, it's a huge amount and um, you can never see all of them at once. Um, and as you get closer to it, to the memorial, um, they become individuals. And so it was a way of trying to convey that the enormous amount of, of people that were murdered um, with the figure emerging, if you like, triumphantly from symbolic uh, crematoria chimney, um, uh, sort of androgynous uh, aspiring figure. So that's, that's the concept for that. The one on the right, which you can see a detail of, it's a, it's a figure which um, comes from the earth, from the ground, from a, a, a kind of morass, which gradually emerges as a human figure. And the idea for this would be about 40 feet high. Um, and this is a very much um, the survivor's concept out of all that awful uh, history, awful situation, the humanity still manages to be formed and holds the embryonic sort of symbol of the future, the, you know, the egg, the embryo um, idea. So it's the individual going on to achieve life and, and, and carry on making life. Those are the two concepts behind that. As you say, they've never been made. And, uh, so um, that's a long story there, but yeah. Thank you for, for both of those. Can we see the next slide, please? This, yeah. this issue of the human figure, which you've already conveyed uh, in your discussion of the Belson figures. This is something which has uh, been with you throughout your career, really. Um, and the use of the human figure, which we'll come to in a moment, is, is uh, very profound. But it hasn't always been like this, has it? Uh, uh, this particular image, which I guess you can see on the screen now with you uh, and the horse's head here, uh, is an interrelationship with a, a very much earlier uh, classical architect uh, archetype. Would you like to uh, explain how this came to be? Yes, this, I will say, I went to art school and then um, for a long time I, um, I, I didn't work as a sculptor, to put it that way. And then through a, a, a coincidence and experience which just came out of the blue, I was asked to do a, a trophy for an equestrian event and the person wanted a horse head, not a, not a um, cup or a shield or anything like that. And in a, in a sort of rush of blood to the head, I went and made six little six inch high horse heads, just, you know, it took me half an hour or something. Uh, again, I'll describe it in the book. And I presented these to the guy as a way of helping him make up his mind. Uh, and, and that turned into him saying, well, please, you make the trophy. And that was the first time I'd touched clay in 15 years or so. And that, um, I made the trophy, of course, the horse head. And it just kick-started me and I kept making horse heads for who knows why. Um, but again, I, I, at that point, I was having some psychotherapy and Jean, the woman who was the psychotherapist, made the comment, well, that's the second time you've been rescued by horses. What, what on earth are you talking about? And she said, I was liberated by Cossacks from a train leaving Belson. And of course, the whole emotional charge of these guys on horseback and imagine full of energy and vitality and i'd never thought about this ever so here we are how many years later i can't think about it for a moment 35 years later or more uh suddenly this this commission out of the blue kick started me making horse heads and i made loads of them 
and people loved them. <laughs> and, but there was a point um, where I thought, well, I can't keep on and on and on making horse heads. I mean, it was lovely. And I felt very, very loved because people, people made lots of nice comments and they bought them. Um, and because of the situation I was in at the time, I was very down and I'd left the matrimonial home and all sorts of stuff like that. So this, these horses, yeah, gave me a new lease of life. But then I thought, you know, I, that, that got me on the, on the road to making sculpture. I started making figurative pieces and um, I have done ever since. Uh, and gradually that became, you know, I don't make horse heads anymore or any animal sculptures. And I, that started me off and I had an exhibition of figurative work and so on. And I went through two or three stages, which um, again, I describe uh, to recently when I'm making again, figurative work, but in a very, um, a very different method to uh, the conventional way of doing it. Perhaps this would uh, be a, an appropriate moment to look at the, the yeah. next slide. I mean, we can to allow what you're saying now to go on. These are uh, uh, merely two illustrations, aren't they, of, of, of larger than life figures. But the things that always struck me, uh, and you may disagree, is the fact that <clears throat> in their conceptual gestation, they are very elemental. Uh, they, they focus on things that we as humans do every day. We breathe every day. Uh, we touch every day. Uh, other sculptures, which we can't see here, uh, convey the idea of seeing, of first light, uh, of eyesight, uh, and things which we take for granted. Uh, and I think in, in these very big figures, uh, and they're not confined to this size, are they? You, you can tell, uh, you can talk about the way in which some of these can be actually quite smaller representations of, a, of the same, same kind of image. Um, they nevertheless have a, a, a real resonance in the way in which you see uh, and you want to interpret life. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, you're absolutely right. And I do, I make figures eight, eight inches high and these two that you see are um, uh, two meters, six, six and a half feet high. And the, the one on the right is about eight feet tall. Um, and they're very, for me anyhow, very as aspiring. The, the one on the left, second breath, it's about, you know, clearly I don't illustrate these things. The, the, the pieces kind of have a life of their own and, and, and I, I kind of tend to make the piece and then worry about what to call it. But the one on the left is called Second Breath. And it does symbolize, you know, second, second crack at life, the second go at life. And it's, it's been a very much admired and successful piece. Um, the one on the right there, a touching victory. Um, so, you know, you can guess where the kind of subconscious motivation, whatever you want to call it, comes from. Um, you know, the sense of survival, the sense of, yeah, I've made it, you know, you didn't get me, guys, and all that. But this all goes on subconsciously, and it's only afterwards that I can actually articulate what these things are about, and then probably not not as well as some people, Julian, which <laughs> looking at you. Um, the, my work is very, um, how can I put it, right brain stuff, you know, it's all about the feeling, the emotion, the sense, not, not worked out. I don't draw a piece and then make it. I, I go straight in and some of the big ones, well, yeah, pretty well all the big ones, I dive straight in, I make the piece that size. Um, so there they are. Yeah. It, 
if you if we go from here to the next uh, set of slides, it, it makes set total sense. I mean, these are very, very monumental works. We've talked about these. But what we see on the screen now uh, are figures which are almost at the opposite end of the scale. And they don't, at first, have that kind of mon monumentality. And these are not big figures at all. But you talked earlier about the enjoyment of the scent, the smell of the materials, the opportunity to literally plunge our arms into the, the pit of clay and mm. to uh, somehow you, you can't grasp anything really, but but you can feel what's around your your hands and your arms. These these figures here, I think, are the are manifestations of the smallest gestures that we as humans are, com are capable of making, uh, in contrast to the ones that we've just been looking at. Would you, what do you feel about these? Yeah, this is very much the last while, four years or so. Again, uh, you know, by accident, I discovered something which answered a lot of questions for me, um, because as I try to explain, the work is not worked out logically. I'll make a piece about this and I'll do it this way. They're, they're, they're an emotional response to the, the feeling of what I want to somehow make concrete. And, and I discovered that, um, again, by accident, that um, if I, instead of modeling in a traditional way, which is making an armature structure and then putting clay on it and building it up and then so on. Um, I go, I do it back to front. I get the clay and as you say, literally plunge my arms into it. I get a mound of clay and I excavate it with my hands, my arms, you know, obviously digging down to create a form which I can't see, but I can image um, to a greater or lesser extent. So I, I imagine as I'm pulling the clay out of the, out of the middle of this heap, I imagine the figure, uh, there are always figures. Um, and I imagine it's, you know, what it might look like. And then when I think I've got something that, um, that I want, I then pour plaster into that void that I've just, the hole that I've just made. Um, and then obviously the plaster sets very quickly, 20 minutes or something. And then I pull the clay away and I have this very exciting reveal of the figure, but not all modeled up with, you know, fingernails and, and, and wrinkles in the skin and all that. It's, it's the essence of the figure and you know what it's doing as you say very everyday um uh, things they're running they're thinking they're listening they're standing and i get the plaster and of course with plaster i can still work on it but i tend to i've got 90 percent 80 90 percent of what i want when i've taken it out of the clay and then obviously I can add bits, take bits off, but 80, 90% of it is there. And what's so exciting is that I couldn't possibly have um, imagined modeling those, those features and those, those crevices and those lumps and hollows. Um, and they've come about simply by the excavating it. Um, and, yeah, you know, that's the way I'm working now. And it, it, for me, very exciting. And I'm not slavishly trying to make arms and legs and, and features, but they emerge, they come out somehow. But um, your perception of the, <clears throat> the outcomes of these things, I think, is justified uh, in the next slide. And it's almost, I think, the penultimate slide for this particular session, which is a yeah. view of your own studio. That's right. This is a piece called Striding, and I think it very much looks like it's striding. It's going for something. 
um, you know, eyeballs out and and really going for it. There's, there's three different um, sizes of it there, as you can see. Um, but it's made that way that I've just described in, in the studio there. Um, you can see the little guy on the right. He's about foot, footish, about foot, 14 inches tall. And, and the other one is six and a half feet, something like that. Um, and then there's a, a, a medium one as well. So it's, it's for me anyhow, it, it's a very exciting way of working. It's unpredictable, which I like. Um, it engages my haptic view of the world. Um, and it's all about feeling, not, not illustrating. Um, and for me, you see, these, these sculptures have their own life, their own integrity. They're not imitating something. They're not imitating, um, you know, life itself. They, they have their own life, which is in a way, going back to what I said right at the beginning, I'm making my own world, <laughs> good or bad or indifferent. So I think you've succeeded and may continue to succeed for a very long time to come. Thank you. Well, that needs no explanation, that slide. That's <laughs> guess who in my studio. <laughs> this yeah, this is just an image of the book. Um, it's a limited edition of a thousand, which are all signed and numbered by me in gold, gold <laughs> pen, that is. Um, and they're not available in bookshops. They're available from the publisher. You see their heavy press dot ink um, because it was designed as a collector's item, not a bookseller's. Um, item, so you can't get it from bookshops, um, but there it is from Heavy Press Inc. And it was published this year, earlier this year, um, in its slipcase. Um, lots of illustrations, and uh, well, I've read a little bit of the text, but it does go into um, the background to a lot of my work. Uh, and it come about because lots of people when they've seen my work have interpreted it one way or another, uh, sometimes very close to the, what resonates with me, uh, other times not so good. So I thought it's time I took ownership of the, the, the story, if you like. And so I started writing this and uh, publishers liked it, so they've done this. And as I say, a thousand uh, edition of a thousand as a collector's item. Thank you so much. Do you have any? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Morris and uh, and Julian. I, um, you know, I want to give our audience the possibility to uh, direct a few questions. I will send out a follow up email where with a link to um, uh, to the book uh, where the book can be ordered. It's a gorgeous book, a beautiful beautiful images, and and also as you said, like your. Uh, um, your life story uh, told in a very um, touching, very emotionally touching way. So uh, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I will stop our screen share now and hope that we'll get some question. Um, and we have one question already actually um, asking whether Emma Grise, Grise was executed as a war criminal after the war. She was indeed she, at the ripe old age of 22. Mm. So she did this as a very young lady. She was hanged apparently at the um, uh, by the British, the British Army, probably because no, the British Army actually liberated Bells and I wasn't there. I would have been, as I said, taken out before then on a train and I was liberated by Cossacks. 
um, on the way to, we don't know where, but somewhere, uh, they intercepted the train. But the British army then prosecuted uh, several war criminals. She was one of them and was hanged for her sins. Yeah, there's a, a very extensive uh, online library. I'm quite surprised to see how sizable it is on Evergrace. But uh, if you want more information, it's um, it's actually uh, pretty good. Mm -hmm. Very good, which didn't happen to all, um, all uh, war criminals, uh, but with her, it was a very uh, direct process, as I, as I have learned. Um, and um, so I don't think, Morris, you spoke much about um, why you weren't, you know, uh, that about being on the train, meaning being taken out of, uh, being taken out of uh, Bergen-Belsen, because that is another instance that saved your life, wasn't it? As far as I'm aware, yes. I, I have to say, I've never gone into a lot of the history and, and, and tried to find out the whole chronology and history. Um, but I do, obviously, I have some knowledge and, um, as far as I'm aware, Belsen was a, uh, a holding camp. It wasn't an extermination camp as such, but uh, there was no machinery for it. But the uh, treatment of us and the starvation and the disease and all the rest of it did a job very well of getting rid of people. Apparently, when the British Army came in, there were about 13,000 unburied corpses laying about um, and some of these hardened uh, army personnel were in tears you know couldn't cope so the the idea was that um, when the Germans were losing the war they wanted to get rid of the evidence and also we would be taken out of Belson and uh, I don't know where we were going, but I believe the idea was to take us somewhere so that we could be exchanged for German prisoners of war. Um, and so we got on the, there were three trains. Ours was the notorious lost train. It meandered about Germany for about 14 days and stopping and starting and all the rest of it. And of course, people were just dying all the time. And eventually, as I say, after 14 days, we got to a village called Trobich. And at that point, the Russian, the Cossacks had already um, requisitioned Trobich. And they, as a train came towards it, they took us off the train. Um, and we lived with them for a few months, three or four months uh, before we, but say myself and my sister, my mother, uh, managed to get to England because my mother was British. Uh, and before everything happened, my, my father was Dutch. And under Dutch law, she had lost her British nationality when she married my father. But they decided before we went into the camp, obviously, um, just before they decided to divorce so that my mother could have her British nationality back. And they felt that it would be an advantage to us, um, you know, my mother and the two children, uh, to get a, to have British nationality. Well, of course, I didn't have any nationality, but my mother managed to persuade one of the Russian uh, army officers or whatever to get back to England for her and obviously take the two of us with her. So that's how we finished up. My grandmother by then had died. She was English as well, but she had died in, in Belson before. Um, and obviously my father, we don't know what happened to him, still don't know what happened to him, but obviously never saw him again. And obviously my little sister died. So just the three of us got to England uh, where my sister and I were naturalized <laughs> to become British. It's quite 
Um, you know, my mother was already British, and obviously, because she spoke perfect English and could give an account of where she'd been to school and all the rest of it, uh, she got her nationality back. So I more or less lived in England ever since. Um, so that, that's, that's in a nutshell. Um, there's details there, obviously, but, uh, you know, how long have you got, Rachel? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very important details, though, uh, that got you to England and got you to uh, really into a really long and uh, prolific teaching career before you even started doing your own artwork, or did you secretly uh, create uh, uh, on the side and you know um, before you? really openly started showing it? I didn't secretly create, no. Um, after art school, my mother and, and my sister and I initially, we'd gone to the States and I came back as a 17 year old uh, to go to art school and um, be independent, and, you know, all the stuff that teenagers yearn for. Uh, so I, when I went to art school here and then I, when I left, I had to earn a living and teaching is the way that a lot of artists earn their living. Um, and that's what I did and I carried on teaching. Um, and I honestly, without getting too, um, too trapped into psychology, I think my experience with Millie of not being able to give her a present that I I'd really, you know, took a lot of determination to hang on to this bloody carrot for I don't know how many weeks because food was, you know, very, very, very hard to come by. But I hung on to this carrot to give to her and the disappointment and frustration of poor kid dying before her first birthday. I think that had a profound effect on me about making art. It was, mm. it was torture. And to go out there after our art school was all right, because it was a, a lifestyle and, you know, you got into it and didn't think too much about where do we go from here. But mm. to sort of try and make a career out of art, you know, I'm sure deep down, as I said earlier, it was riddled with, with uh, trauma and, and, and my, um, my very illogical resentment of Millie not being able to have a present. Um, you know, I didn't obviously, you know, I was a young teenager and so on. It never occurred to me that this was maybe lurking around in, in the background all the time. And it took quite an effort to eventually, and starting with the horses, as I say, and then, by then I was nearly 40 years old, I think, 38, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and this sort of accidental thing of having this commission to do, suddenly it, things started to happen. And yeah, you know, making these things and, and, and having people say they're great and buying them. And, and because of my situation at the time, it was, it felt like a new life beginning. Um, so long answer to your short question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all very complex. Things. Um, so David says, thank you so very much for this talk. Very touching presentation. And he asked mm -hmm. Morris, um, uh, I'm, he's very interested in your abandoning traditional sculpture making by digging into the clay and filling the cavities mm -hmm. with plaster. And he asked mm -hmm. whether you ever worked in stone. Uh, chipping away pieces seems to agree with the idea to leave preconceived forms behind. How do you think about that? Yeah, I can answer you. I can't carve. I've tried it. Uh -huh. But of clay, it's just 
speaks to me, it smells right, it feels right. Um, carving granite's too easy, you know, I like the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> There seems to be also the sensual, sensual aspect to it, right? Because you said, uh, you know, that you um, really like the, the smell of the clay and, and the feel of the clay. So, uh, you know, creating and, and smelling, that, that seems to be kind of a um, very um, primary um, experience. Yeah. When you, it's a similar sort of uh, response when you're dealing with prints. It's uh, the, the smell of the uh, of the inks in a, in a print studio. Absolutely nothing like it. It's quite extraordinary. You couldn't explain it. It's just something that speaks to you. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're all, we're all human animals, and we like <laughs> these experiences. And the you know clay is is cool, and oh, it's just wonderful to touch. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. So Joseph uh, mentions that he thinks that many survivors had fears of dogs. And actually, uh, um, looking at your dog, I'm starting to be afraid of them, actually. <laughs> like uh, your dog, uh, even without seeing it li alive and, and touching it and experiencing it, 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 the, the three dimensionality, I. Uh, um, yeah, I, it, it just uh, emanates, you know, uh, fear, I find. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, yeah, and I, I very much admire you for facing your fears and, you know, um, uh, which is, uh, yeah, uh, I admire that. Um, so Logic question by Linda. Are any of your pieces in the United States where the public can see them? Yes, I have a couple of pieces. One at Nashville, the um, university, uh, Vanderbilt University. There's a piece there at the Children's Hospital um, in, in Nashville. Um, I also have a piece in Kentucky at the Agena Hospital, the um, uh, University of Kentucky, there's a hospital there, and they fairly recently um, got a piece of mine, and a very touching story about um, its second breath. Uh, they've got a very touching story about, there's a children's hospital and a, a lady whose child was very much touch and go, whether it would survive or not. And she used to go out every day and talk to the sculpture, to talk to my sculpture, a uh, second breath and say, you know, give my child a second chance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the child made it. And, uh, you know, the um, director of the hospital um, related this to me. So it's very touching. So mm -hmm. those two pieces, um, there are pieces, private individuals have bought pieces. They're not in public display, but there's several pieces. Um, there's a couple in Florida, that, you know, somebody in New York very recently bought a piece. Um, so I, they're, they're in private hands. So there's, there's a few, yeah. yeah. But those two, like I said, at the hospitals, they're the only public ones so yeah. far. But I'm still working, Rachel. <laughs> so <laughs> to 120 we hope uh and beyond so uh, i will i will mention you to uh, like that to this event there's a follow-up email so i will mention these two pieces and direct people to that um okay. we're going a little bit over time but i uh, want want you to have a chance to to react to all questions. There's really only one more question and one comment. Um, do you have any relationships with other survivors who have active studio practices? If so, have those impacted your art making? The answer is no, I don't. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So it's all comes out of you, basically, from you. Sorry, or sorry. So, so all your art comes comes out of you, um, not yeah, oh, yeah. Off. So, yeah, yeah, very much, yeah. 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 
That's absolutely amazing. And um, so Nina, um, and I want to conclude with that, has a uh, comment. She says, both of my parents are survivors of the Holocaust, and I want to share that you have touched my heart and soul with your strength of character and ability to use your art to transform your hor horrific traumatic childhood experiences into something so creative and beautiful, as if we are seeing someone heal in front of our eyes as we view your pieces. Thank you so much for sharing your amazing story of recovery and strength. Thank you well, so thank much, Forrest. I have nothing to add to, to that other than wishing you that you go from strength to strength. And thank you so much for um, talking to us and for sharing your life story and your art with us. Thank you. And thank you, Julian, for the very very beautiful, very inspiring very conversation. Thank you. Like, thank you. Thank That's you, Rachel. Thank you. Really. Thank you. 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 Thank you.